Honestly, what do you think when you see young British Asian men like this on the streets? I feel like every time you turn on your TV screen, open up a newspaper or even go on social media, the only stories you hear about British Asian men are of them being groomers and terrorists and drug dealers. I'm a British Pakistani and I used to be a teacher. It bothers me that every year boys are leaving school with all this negativity on their shoulders. The media representation of us, it sucks. It's a world that most of us don't usually get to see. There's quite a lot of temptations, good and bad. Quite a lot of uh, drug, drugs about. In the last two decades, things have gone from bad to worse. My name is Maureen Bay, and in this film, I'm going to ask why these young men are getting left behind as the rest of Britain moves on without them. You need to get money to the house, you need to have a job, whatever have you, so your personal aspirations kind of take a back seat for a while. I'll be asking why others with similar roots seem to have fewer hang-ups about being British and Asian. We don't like working for people, we all work for ourselves. This is why we set up our own businesses. I believe some of the other cultures are still a bit strict and a bit backward. But the Gujaratis have, I would say, gone slightly forward. I'll travel back to the region of my home country, which 70% of British Pakistanis can trace their roots to, and which some of the younger generation of men now see as their future. How many cars do you have here? Nine, nine cars. You've got nine cars here. My goodness. So what's the problem with Britain's Pakistani men? And are we now in danger of creating a lost generation? We came from a first world country with a third world mentality. My dad moved here from Pakistan in the early 1980s, so I want to begin by understanding the values that he brought with him. Papa, why did you move to England? Only for the reason of the betterment of my children, their education, their independence, their exposure and, you know, things like that. Opportunities. Opportunities. That was the reason I came here. So education was what you valued most for your children? Because that is how we have been brought up. Our aim was to make you professionals. Our children must grow up in good environment, with good education. So what was it like when you moved here? Like any other new place or new environment anyone goes to, there's struggle involved. And similarly, but things were very different to today's conditions here. Whatever came to my way, even odd jobs, I took them up. I didn't just sit all my life here. I've been working. Do you notice a difference between the new generation of boys, the younger generation, and your generation, what they were like? In the last two decades, things have gone from bad to worse. In what way? Jen? Because What's happened? The reason is they are now greedy. They want to make quick money. So they see their friends driving, you know, flashing cars, driving cars, motorbikes, going on holidays. They can't afford to do that. Plus, they get into bad societies, you know. That is also the thing. And when you get into a wrong society by the greed, due to the greed, then naturally you'll fall apart one, at some point. That's not just Asian boys, though. It's not just Asian boys who are going into wrong crowds to make money. No, they are Asian boys. But it's not well, just Asian boys, it's in all communities. No, it, good and bad is in all communities. But you asking me why aren't they studying? Because their focus is not on education. Neither their parents' focus was on education. If you have not paid attention on your children and just been running after money, it's bound to, you know, backfire somewhere. And that's what happens. Not a lot of sympathy from my dad. His generation had to struggle to get a foothold here. But life's more complicated for their children and grandchildren. There are real issues facing young British Pakistani men. And I think it's really important for us all to understand what those are, but also understand the lives that some of these men are living. 
Bradford has the highest proportion of Pakistani residents of any British city. In the last few years, there have been more and more signs that the young men here are struggling. Drug crime has risen, and British Pakistani men make up a disproportionate number of those convicted. I'm at a supermarket car park in the city, where every few weeks, hundreds meet to show off their cars. It's a lot of boys. And a, a lot of loud cars. But the car park is full, um, and there's definitely predominantly Asian boys. I'm going to be deaf by the end of today. Tell me about why so many young Asian boys are here today to show their cars. Because why not? Look at the atmosphere. Everyone goes for a good time. Let off a couple of shots. <laughs> some people have addiction to drugs, some people have addictions to cocaine, we have addictions to cars. <laughs> That's what it is. How do you afford the cars? Like, I couldn't afford one of these cars. Alhamdulillah, I've got about three, four cars to myself. How? I haven't got one. I'm young, I'm young, I don't have no bills. I'm, I'm, my mum and dad look after me a lot. I'm a spoiled child. There are a lot of stereotypes associated with young Asian boys. Yeah, they assume that we all sell drugs. Do you think so? <laughs> and they see young Asian boys, yeah. like boys who look they think just like you. cars, I think young Asian drug dealers yeah. are why they're missing about. But they don't know we're having a good time, as in they should come down for themselves and see that we're actually yeah. having a good time. We have got insurance, we have got MOT. Oh, we're we're <laughs> just uh, no road tax. <laughs> 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 guys get the money to do this like I work a lot but I can't afford to buy even a car let alone do all this amazing stuff to it how do you do that I'm believing on the tax office I can't so believe it just, and I believe yeah. it yeah so it's all from just hard work and the saving really so especially Asians they're all from stay at home and they, they don't tend to leave house until right later on in life um, and so they've got no mortgage none of that to pay for so it is a lot easier to say why is that? Why don't they want to move out of home until a later age? It's easier to, if you're staying with parents. Um... And you get cooked for. Yeah. <laughs> and washed for. Washed, laundry, <laughs> <laughs> these boys are so aware that there are so many negative stereotypes surrounding them. Coming here is a place where they feel like they're surrounded by people who won't judge them. They can make noise, they can express themselves, they can, you know, show something that they're really proud of. They're proud of their cars and they can show that off without, you know, having to worry about what the world thinks about them. A lot of these boys spoke about not having much responsibility at home, not having to pay for a mortgage or bills or groceries. And I can't help but wonder, if you're so pampered at home, how prepared are you for the outside world? Despite all the bravado on show here and the fact that most of the men I spoke to have a job or are at college, almost every single one still lives at home with his parents. Housing is relatively cheap here, so what's holding them back? Pakistanis make up a fifth of Bradford's population, mostly living in highly segregated areas. In some parts of the city, it seems almost everyone is British Pakistani. And most of them, along with 70% of all British Pakistanis, can trace their roots back to one district in Kashmir, Mirpur. Everyone must know what everyone's getting up to because the houses are so close together and the roads are so small and... It's literally alleyways with just houses packed next to each other. You wouldn't get away with anything here. 
One result of this is that Pakistanis are more likely to go to segregated schools than any other ethnic group. I wanted to understand what impact this is having on their education. I went to meet 27-year-old Nav and his friends Gohir and Wakas. Nav grew up nearby before leaving for university. What was school life like for you, like, prior to you going to uni and everything? It was predominantly Asian school. 8% was Asian, uh, specifically Pakistani, Mirpuri, Rap kind of So uh, what we were used to was just predominantly Asian people. So I guess that must have been a culture shock when you went to uni and it yeah, wasn't... Yeah, it was, it was, it was. I had to kind of get out of my comfort zone and kind of had to talk and meet people called David and John and <laughs> which 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 was a good experience don't get me wrong I mean you have to kind of get used to it don't you yeah I went more like just to get away from Bradford itself I wanted a different perspective because so, you know when you're in a specific area for such a long time you're bombarded with the same kind of mentality thinking and you just kind of want to hear a different perspective don't you mm -hmm. But then, Nav told me that he dropped out before the end of his first term. He's back living with his parents, working as a PPI claims handler. Yeah, I was homesick after about a month, and I was kind of fish out of water or something. Yeah, yeah. So it's the first time you've kind of totally knew, everything's new, none of my friends were around me. I had to kind of do everything for myself. I think a lot of people from you know, Kashmiri backgrounds, they don't really have that, because their mum kind of was a rules a roost. So they don't have that kind of experience where they have to go out and fend for themselves. And uh, my eldest sister went to uni as well. Did your sister complete uni? Yeah, she did. She got a degree in law, I think it was. Wow. Yeah. Times have changed. So have yeah, but times are changing in the Asian community as well. Yeah. Do you think it has? Yeah, I think it has. It's slowly, it will change, isn't it? Because women per capita are getting more highly educated than, or as educated as men, aren't they? Yeah. In fact, British Pakistani girls are now outperforming their brothers at GCSEs, and more are going to university. What do you think young Pakistani boys yeah. here, where you're from, yeah. what do they value? Majority of people from Kashmiri backgrounds, the main purpose is to get money into the house. That's what it's all about. You need to get money into the house, you need to have a job, whatever of you, so your personal aspirations kind of take a back seat for a while. Do you think that that sort of hinders young people, young boys here, from progressing? I think it's more of kind of mentality, kind of trying to have that mentality of hunger for knowledge or education. I think that's probably where we're struggling to a certain extent. Yes! yes! Nav spoke about how he wanted to move out to university. He wanted to break out of the community and broaden his horizons, and he tried. But he struggled, because if you look at a lot of these Pakistani boys and the lives that they live, they have their food cooked for them. They have their clothes washed for them. They have this status of being the prince of the house. They can't really go wrong when they're living at home. For girls, for Pakistani girls, a lot of them, getting an education is the only route they will have to gain some sort of independence and some sort of freedom. But life in Bradford used to be so different for Pakistani men. They first started arriving in the early 1960s, drawn by the prospect of work in the booming mills and factories. Most of them left their families behind and sent money back home. In many ways, it's the classic immigrant success story. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. What's really interesting is that this restaurant opened 50 years ago to serve breakfast to the workers, the Pakistani workers who had moved over to Britain to work in the mills right behind me. Um, but now, looking around, the mills have gone. That, that no longer exists. The original reason why people moved over here to work here, the factories, that's, that may have gone, but the community is still very much here. For the first generation, it was clear what they had to do to have status in the community. Work hard in the jobs that were available, send money home, and build a life for their families. But now that's done, and the mills have gone, 
What's left? 26% of young people in the city are out of work and the range of job opportunities is limited. For Pakistani men in work, one in four are taxi drivers. I got a sense of the problems facing young Mirbury men here when I met 17-year-old Lukman, who's also known as Lucky. Uh, you're like, um, yeah, my name's uh, Lukman. I'm a B of H and I'm B7 here. So, they're really short. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Over half of Pakistani households in Britain are classes low income. Where Lucky and his friend Abu Bakr live is one of the most deprived areas in the country. Since the age of 13, he's had to work, sometimes juggling three or four jobs at once. Why did you need to work so much when you were so young? That's when we got a divorce now. Okay. And, uh, so obviously, I was like, I had to step up. I had to be like the man of the house. Step up, look after my sister, look after my mom, and just basically do what my dad didn't do, basically. So at least my mom's happy. Like, she's getting the money, the food's coming there, sister's happy, she's going to school, we're all well dressed. At least, you know, we got heat in, we can, you know, wash our faces with hot water. So things like that, yeah. Lucky is far from alone. The percentage of single parent families in the British Pakistani community has doubled since the mid 1990s. And then how did your GCSEs go? They didn't go that well, because, like I said, due to work and uh, home, I was more focused on that, so I barely turned up for them. Was there no temptation to make more money quicker in a bad way? There's quite a lot of temptations, good and bad. Um, mostly bad, because uh, a lot of, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, drug, drugs about and stuff like that, but um, most people don't, you know, get influenced by it. Just literally, just make a phone call and, yeah, we're just dealing like that. But obviously we decide we'd rather work hard. And, yeah, like, obviously at the end of the day we have to remember that we're Muslims and we have to show people that, you know, we're good, we're kind-hearted and, uh, yeah, not everyone's bad. So what's, what's all of this? What's, what does top of the world mean? Top of the world, I think it's because of the view. I think, yeah, because it's so high, you can see the view. I think, yeah, that's why it's top of the world. When the sun happens, everyone just comes here. So. Do they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just, when I mean, the sun's saying, honestly, it's proper nice. Oh. Only 51% of British Pakistanis achieve grades A to C at GCSE level, compared to 74% of British Indians. Lucky failed his GCSEs, but is now thinking of retaking them. You said you're the main breadwinner of your house. Yeah. And how are you going to balance, you know, working and retaking all your GCSEs and then when you go to college? I mean, maybe to make it easier, I might just take like one, two days of work, like a couple of days of work so I can be more focused on GCSEs. Then hopefully if I, when I pass, which I know I will, hopefully I'll then yeah, just go back into working six days a week again. And six days? Yeah, six you days. You work six days? Yeah, six days a week, yeah. Do you have any regrets? I wish I just got my head down a bit more, came my mouth and just, you know, just grafted it out. Maybe I would have, you know, focused on my GCSEs a bit more and uh, passed them. I wouldn't be in this position. When we stood, and they said, we're on the top of the world, and they're looking at the view of Bradford, and they couldn't see further. They couldn't see beyond that. And then, obviously, there's Lucky's story and the fact that he was the breadwinner of his house at 13 years old. He had the responsibility of looking after a household, a responsibility that grown men struggle with when he was, when he was 13 years old. Like his Mirbori forefathers, and like my own dad, Lucky is grafting. But times have changed, and it's hard to feel optimistic for him. There's a lack of opportunities in this community, and some young men are being drawn into crime. And I can't help feeling that there's a narrow range of possibilities for what men can become here. But I'd heard about one business that seems to offer the promise of money and status. This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. Nobody's going to have a Lamborghini next week, and, you know, it just doesn't work like that, okay? However, this is a two- to five-year retirement plan, okay? 
Multi-level marketing is built on selling goods and services like gas, electricity or mobile phone contracts, earning a commission on every sale. But the real money is made by signing up new people to the business. The reason is that we don't follow any of the traditional marketing routes, like we don't advertise on the TV, which costs thousands There's controversy of around businesses like these. And we go direct to the customer. This is but that doesn't seem to have deterred the young men at this recruitment evening. This is called social marketing, word of mouth marketing, and it's the most powerful way to advertise in the 21st century. And let me give you an example of this. Awaiting the arrival of the man who spearheaded the success of multi-level marketing in Bradford, I'm struck by the fact that almost all the audience are young Pakistani men. So we can welcome him to the front. Bradford's very own top producing senior vice president and Circle of Champions member, Mr. Mohammed Abu Bakr Qasim. There was no mention of how much money the new recruits will actually earn, but at 36, Abu Bakr Qasim claims to have made enough money to retire on and has recently been promoted to the highest position the company has to offer. When I started, there was many people who were negative. You heard it within my testimonial. All my friends, they said, this would never work. You know, my wife said to me, you're going to get arrested. This is illegal. And today, standing here as, you know, a senior vice president, and this should be enough proof for you guys that if a guy, if an average Joe from Bradford grew up in BD8 can actually do this, then there isn't a single person in this audience today who cannot achieve exactly the same. watching a long line of young recruits being awarded impressive-sounding titles. It's not hard to see the appeal. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Bar. I'm, I'm 18 years old and, and I live in a small town near Bradford called Keithley. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, one of the young men who was promoted that evening, had recruited two new members. You're getting this business at 479, yeah? I tripled, nearly quadrupled my payment back in the first month. Meeting Daniel and his uncle, I was growing increasingly sceptical. Here, multi-level marketing seems to be taking advantage of the Asian extended family. It's uncle selling to nephews, it's cousins roping in cousins. In fact, Daniel had been recruited by his uncle, who are signing up the new recruits. They're each about to cough up a start-up fee of £479. The only person it does not work for is the person that quits. So, in order to get started, he yeah. needs to switch his gas and electric bill, get a SIM card yeah. and buy his mum some cream. And not only that, he gets the two points uh, and also uh, he gets the residual income for his own gas electric every month as well. You all start off as a team TT. Hopefully, uh, within the next seven days, I'm going to help you all the way to get up to ETT, which is seven days, which is literally an executive team trainer. And when you get to executive team leader, the reason why you got there is now you're becoming an executive team leader. You yeah. can lead a team. Yeah. And when you become a TC, that's, that position is called turning from tragic to magic. How many hours do you put into this? Because you're... How old are you? 18. You're 18. So how many hours do you do... Because you've progressed, you've got, had a promotion. Yeah. I, uh, to be honest, I only put maybe a couple of hours a week, never that. Or two, three hours a week. Right. So not much. I'm just... Yeah, mainly part-time, a couple of hours okay. here and there. After struggling at school, Daniel is now studying at a local college, but it's clear that he sees this as an easier route to riches and success. Did you ever think you'd be an executive of something? No, not, no, not like that. I just thought I'd be a normal guy working a job. But now here, I've got a title now, I'm an executive team trainer. Hopefully be executive team leader soon. So it feels good. What does that mean to you, to be like an executive or a, a team leader? It feels, uh, it feels really good actually because I've got like a title. I'm like a doctor and that. My executive team trainer version. Couldn't you just become a doctor? If you want to be a doctor, you would study medicine. If you want to be a lawyer, you study law. With this, it's, you you just there's no qualification, so you, it's more easy being a role model in this than as a, being a doctor or a lawyer or something like that.
meeting these boys just made me feel like they were a little bit lost. And I think about their grandparents who came over here with a strong sense of purpose. They wanted to build new lives. So they worked really hard and they bought houses and they were successful, which gave them a sense of status and achievement. I feel like the boys over here are searching for a sense of purpose, for a sense of status and recognition. For some in Bradford, multi-level marketing has stepped in to fill a void and on the face of it offers an easy way up, the promise of success without having to work as hard as their grandfathers did. Coming from a Pakistani family myself, I can see how it cleverly appeals to our community's values of extended family and male camaraderie. But these values are shared by many other Asian communities, which don't seem to be struggling in the same way. A decade after Mirburi Pakistani started settling in the north, another Asian group had a very different experience of migration to Britain. For over a hundred years, Uganda was home to a large Indian Gujarati community. But in 1972, dictator Idi Amin seized their property and wealth before expelling them from the country under the threat of death. As former subjects of the British Empire, the Gujaratis already had British passports only permitted to leave Uganda with less than £100 each and small amounts of jewellery. Around 30,000 fled to the UK as refugees. Now, Gujaratis are one of the highest earning ethnic minority groups in the UK. Across Leicester, Gujaratis like Atul and his family have built thriving businesses. So people that came here with 100 pounds, two pounds, they worked hard, they all worked in factories and all that, but they said, this is not for us. Why yeah. do you think that is? Gujarati people, they've always been business-minded. You know, they've never been turned to anything else. When we came to this road, this road was dead. They were gonna knock everything down. If it wasn't for people from Uganda, this road wouldn't exist. You can have your law degree, you can have this degree, but with that, you still can't get a job here. You'll be working in Subway. So it's better if you build something out of nothing and make it a business. With that, at least you can be proud of it. Atul's nephew, 18-year-old Pavan, is the youngest member of the family to become an entrepreneur. So this is your sandwich spot? Yeah, this is it. This is amazing. With the financial help and support of his father, Rajesh, Pavan is already running his third business. So when I was growing up, yeah. my parents, I don't think they would have ever let me go into business. Even business if I, yeah. yeah, even if I had the best <laughs> idea, it was very much yeah. like you need to... Educate. Yeah, be the best at school, or you need to get the top grades. If I got like 98%, it'd be, yeah. where, where's the other 2%? Yeah. <laughs> so why do you think that your family kind of were happy for you to go down the business route? My granddad used to make sure I was there. Every time I was off, I'd make sure I was there. Yeah. At the shop, so I at least had a bit of knowledge of what he was doing and everything. OK. And since then, I thought, there's no point in me doing education if my granddad can do so well. Yeah. That's why I thought, it's better if I do my own thing. The feeling of this place is so different from Bradford, and I think some of this has to do with how outward-facing their businesses have made the Gujaratis. In fact, Gujaratis are far more likely than any other British Asian group to live in multi-ethnic neighbourhoods and are twice as likely as British Pakistanis to marry outside their ethnic group. I got a sense of this openness when I joined Pavan, his dad and uncle for a night out. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. I genuinely didn't know that there's like a culture of Asian people going and hanging out in the pub. I just never associated the pub with like a... Asian thing. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of Asians actually go to the pub. I noticed a lot of the people, half the people here are 
Uh, it must be Indian too. Yeah. Asian. So more multi multicultural. Obviously, British Pakistanis are Muslims, so most don't drink alcohol. But Gujaratis do seem to have found it easier to adapt to the British way of life. So when you came over, obviously one thing I know you brought with you, as I've learned, is your business acumen sort of came over with you to this country. Besides that, what values did you bring over with you? Like I said, we came here young age, so we thought we're British. We're different. We don't have to go to the temple. We don't have to do this. And, it, you know, our father was teaching us, no, save money, go to the temple, do this, blah, blah, blah. Apart and from your family, do you think the wider Gujarati community is willing, no, it is moving ahead? I believe some of the other cultures are still a bit strict and a bit backward. Mm -hmm. But the Gujaratis mm -hmm. have, I would say, gone slightly forward. And we're more flexible now. We accept it's a modern time. And it's their future and it's up to them what they want to do now. So, Pavan, do you think you'd marry outside of your community or outside of your culture? Uh, if you meet someone and like, it's, it's the right person, then, yeah. You're open to yeah, marrying open. out? Yeah. And what if you saw that um, sometimes Pavan cooks dinner, sometimes she cooks dinner? You see, that's another thing now. We're modern. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not that modern. You're not that modern. No. <laughs> The Gujaratis' long tradition of business and their willingness to mix seem to have contributed to their economic success. Having met Pavan and understanding his background, his circumstances, and then having met the boys in Bradford, it does make me wonder, is it actually anything to do with ethnicity? Is it to do with whether you're Meerburi or Gujarati? Or is it simply about your socio-economic context that influences your pathway to success? What is it about the Gujaratis that seems to give them the confidence to know which traditions to hold on to and which to leave behind? I spotted a guy online who I thought might have some answers. 25-year-old Parley Patel is building a career as a writer and a performer and has over 40,000 subscribers on YouTube. Let's go to the pub for a glass of wine. Humbo more than two are seen, Mate. I think I'm meeting him in the shed at the back. It's a beautiful house. What a massive garden. Hi. Hi. Right. Hi. Marie, you nice to it. meet you. you. Made it. How's it going? Marie. Nice to meet you. Welcome to the studio. Parley's parents were initially skeptical of his choice of career. They came round to it in the end, but only because he'd been to university and satisfied their expectations first. You know, like everyone around me, my age, was doing law, medicine, dentistry, financial maths, straight maths, biomed, like, you know, accounting and finance. Yeah. Like, do, you, do you think that is an obstacle that a lot of young Asian boys sort of face, the fact that they want to go into these various industries that their parents aren't familiar with or that aren't respected, so they're forced to go down an academic route that perhaps they're not... A, maybe they don't feel like they're good at it or they're not passionate about it. Yeah, definitely. I think it is overwhelming for them to even tell their parents that I want to do this. I've got friends who have really modern parents, like, really modern. I say modern because... Modern. <laughs> it's not modern if you won't let your kids do what they want type thing, but their parents literally just won't. They'll be like, no, you can't do that. You can't work in that. So we've got the wig. Some of Parley's like most popular videos playfully satirise the stereotypes within his own community. Yeah. OK, so give me a situation. Let's do some improv. Right. I am your daughter and mm. I want to go out to a girl by night. Mommy? This is mine, isn't it? Um, uh, You're borrowing mommy's clothes, aren't you? Yes. Is that OK? Yeah. Can I wear it? I let you this time. Thank Come you. on, tuck this in properly okay. around the corner. Don't like straw hair. No, this, no it's okay. healthy. You put chemicals it's in your fashion. hair, you're going to die early. Maybe one day I will die too, and then you will forget me. Hmm? That's what you want, isn't it, mommy to die? No, 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 it's fine. And remember, don't talk to the boys. Boys is bad news. Boys is bad OK? News. Yes. What mommy tells you is? Good news. Good news. We'll work on that. Yeah. You need brain tonic, no? <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That was so good. 
Set my dress out. What qualities are expected of a successful Gujarati man? It comes down to independence. Um, and that's a big attribute of Gujarati culture. Huge attribute. We don't like working for people, we all work for ourselves. This is why we set up our own businesses and this is why we rather do it ourselves and if the institution doesn't give us a job, we'll open up our own institution. You look at those migrants that came over from East Africa, as refugees a lot of them came, mm. with nothing in their pockets, now run these jumbo businesses and our lords and mayors. And this is what my mum and dad always tell me, they're like, rubbish, you have no excuse not to be successful. They're like, you have everything and more. Does that also bring additional pressure? That Gujarati entrepreneurial spirit is there. They're like, how you need merchandise, you need clothes, you need product, you need a look, you need a range. They're like, we'd make something out of it. But you know, with anything you do independently, you do have to work with what's around you. Mm. It's that. And I think this is why I really began to love my culture again. Because like, I started all this kind of like rolling my eyes at everything, like, like the whole desi kind of attitude to everything. But then I've kind of come around and be like, well, I do still roll my eyes and I always will. But then I began to love my culture and saw like the silver lining in the end. I can't do simple garba. This is this is what we call dadima garba. Oh no, am I doing the grandma? Nah, you're fine, you're fine. Kale was able to step beyond the very narrow expectations that exist for Asian men. And I wonder what gave him the confidence to be able to do that? Is it because the Gujarati community is more liberal and more accepting? Or is it because the economic success of the community means that the boys have more security? It made me think about how much has been stacked against the young Mirbury men I'd met. But I also question the wisdom of them pursuing schemes like multi-level marketing. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. It's nice to see you again. What's going on here? No, oh, perfect. So is, are you guys here for...? For Tanya. We're the new uh, recruits. Oh, right. You've yeah. been recruiting new yeah. people. Where are my old recruits? Where's... Um, Faisan and oh, fortune, fortune for them too. They uh, didn't feel like it was for them, so they left. So you guys are new recruits. Yeah. When did you join? We're going to a talk tomorrow. Have you been to one of the talks yet? Uh, no, we viewed some no. online class. Right. But uh, hopefully tomorrow we're going to one in Bradford and then uh, hopefully join it. What are you hoping to achieve? Uh, get financially free, uh, like don't really need to work. and. Uh, for myself and family. Yeah. What about you? I've heard about it a couple of years back, but I wasn't really too bothered about it. And I'm at uni now myself. Are I'm you at uni? What are you yeah, doing? I'm doing business and enterprise management. Nice. Uh, obviously, I stay away at Sheffield. So now that I've come back, he's told me that he's doing quite well on it. And obviously, I've seen quite the work he's doing. Yeah. And he's told me about it. So I'm looking like it's quite interesting. So obviously, I want to join mm -hmm. and maybe do well myself. Is that quite different to sort of your home life? Wouldn't? Yeah, definitely. In what could, way? Tell me about that. Uh, obviously, you don't have your mum and dad ringing you every two minutes saying, come back home. So <laughs> it's a lot different. Obviously, you just need to maintain how to... Yeah, of course. It makes you quite independent as well because uh, you're doing your own um, washing and everything, cooking, so... Do you find that difficult? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. I come back every week for the washing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Daniel relies on multi-level marketing as his sole income, but it was unclear just how much he was actually making. You've got two new people giving it a go. If they actually sign up, yep. then that's points for you, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And what are you aiming to do now? So apart from becoming executive team leader, what's, what's the long-term aim? Obviously, the long-term aim is to become SVP like Abu Bakr Qasim. So hopefully, I should, well, soon, if I could, a couple of years' time, hit that position. Okay. Thanks, Danielle. Best of luck. Whatever you think of multi-level marketing, it seems to me that because these young men live in such a closely knit community, the cycle of new recruits will just go on and on.
I'm from a Pakistani household, but because we were in London, it was inevitable that we'd mix with people of different cultures and different backgrounds. And I feel like that's something the young boys here aren't able to do. They aren't able to get to know different perspectives and viewpoints and experiences beyond their own. At the same time, I can see why the young men here wouldn't want to move out of the mini Pakistan that they've built, because within their community, within their households, they are the little princes and they are completely indulged. So to find out where some of the attitudes that have shaped this community come from, I'd like to go back to where it all started. I'd like to go back to Mirpur. Whenever I've visited Pakistan in the past, it's been to see family in the larger cities. So this is all very new to me. From the British Pakistanis that I've met, their experience seems so different to mine. And because, as I've realised, the majority of British Pakistanis come from this area, come from Mirpur, I'm really hoping to get an insight into what it's like where they where they come from. Welcome to Mirpur, the land of peace and prosperity. In the 1950s, Mirpur was a collection of small villages in rural Kashmir. But then the building of the Mangla Dam flooded the entire valley, displacing over 100,000 people. Many of the men went to places like Bradford at the invitation of the British government. Now is the dry season, so the reservoir the dam created is empty, revealing a strange, ghostly landscape. This is it. We're in... This is where old Mirapur was before it got flooded. And it's really weird because you can kind of see the leftovers of of a town, of a, of a village, in, in some places. It's so weird to think that this is where the story of all those Mirapuris in Bradford started. This is where it all began. What must have it taken for a, a farmer from Mirapur, from old Mirapur, to pack up their bags ends up in Bradford to, to start a life and to support their family. How much hard work must that have taken? Modern Mirpur has grown into a town of over 150,000 people built in part with some of the two and a half billion pounds a year that British Pakistanis send back to the country. Thousands regularly visit Mirpur and many own family homes in the town. I went to meet one of the Mirpuri men who had been part of that first wave of immigration to Britain. Let's just say he had plenty in common with my dad when it came to the younger generation. <laughs> और बर्तानिया गवर्नमेंट ने कहा कि जो आदमी जवान जवान है उनको भेज दो तो उस वक्त मैं उन जवानों में से गया था आपने कहा कि आपके जमाने में आदमी बहुत मेहनती थे तो जब आप आजकल के बच्चों को देखते हैं क्या वो वो ही अम, कैसे कहते हैं मैं वो ही जी उनमें है नहीं अब जो तीसरी लाद है ना अच्छा इनको हर चीज मिल जाती है ठीक ठाक तो फिर आजकल किसानियों के साथ रहते हैं या मीरपुर मीरपुर के साथ रहते हैं वो क्यों करते हैं कुछ हमारी जो वहाँ जनरेशन पैदा हुई है ना वो कुछ मैं समझता हूँ कि उस माहौल में पैदा हुई है उन्हें यहाँ का कल्चर नहीं है उनके पास अगर कल्चर हो ना तो वो ये फसाद वगैरह बरपार ना करें Mr. Hussain felt that the values of hard work and the desire to integrate hadn't been passed down to his grandson's generation.
But then I found out that one of his grandsons had actually moved to Mibur. Although he grew up in the UK and graduated as an accountant, Goho was frustrated by the low-level jobs he was getting. Seeking better opportunities, he came back to help run the family business, which cannily exploits the cultural connections between Mirbur and Britain. I mean, you've got so much stuff and you've got so many British products. There must be a massive demand for this stuff. Basically, the reason why we've got more British products is because uh, the Brits coming uh, back and forth throughout the whole year. Yeah. And there's some people that are, you could say, probably attached to their um, roots or their culture that would probably prefer coming back here and meeting their people and, yeah. you know, spending time with them. I consider myself as, like, someone who's really in touch with her culture. Over here, I feel... I don't know, I don't fully feel like I belong here either. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fully Pakistani. I'm very much a British Pakistani. I wouldn't say that just about you. That's yeah. probably the same thing about me as well. It's because we've adapted some things from our British culture as well because we're not just Pakistanis, we're British as well. Yeah. So that's why we, 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 we get uh, the, like, you know, we've got the best of both worlds. So do you feel like you belong here? Do you feel like you're, you're one of these people yeah. and yeah. this is home? Yeah, this is home to me. That is home as well. That's home number two, though. Yeah. This is home number, number one. one. On a drive around town, I begin to understand what makes life in Mirbur so appealing for Goha. This I recently got as a gift on my wedding, this car. This car was a gift this from who? From my, from my dad and my elder brother. Oh. This was a gift, and that's my other car that, 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 and you, that you, Honda right there, the white one. Oh, wow, and you've customised it? I've customised that one, yeah. How many cars do you have here? Nine, nine cars. You've got nine cars here. My goodness. At 23, Gohar has recently married, and in true Pakistani style, he and his new wife live with his parents, but in considerably greater luxury than the family enjoyed in the UK. So this is the house. This is your house. My goodness. Massive. Family girl. Good, thank you. How are you? She's my lovely wife. Nice my lovely wife. <laughs> yes, I did, I did. That's the guest bedroom. Bedroom with attached bath. With the attached bathroom. Yeah. yeah. This dining. So dining room. This is TV lounge. Even in Pakistan, building this house isn't isn't cheap. Of course, it's not. Yeah. But how? So how does your life here and this lifestyle, this house, how does it compare to your life in Britain? I mean, in, in England, we ha we do have a three bedroom house. In like, info. As you know as well, I mean, the size of the rooms. Yeah. It's much, much smaller. Yeah. That's why we, they want to like live here, because of this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You can't make it in England this lifestyle. It's not that expensive like in front. This house is not more than 150 pounds, 150,000 pounds. No. Yeah, all together, even land. No, it can't be. Yeah. <laughs> all expenses, 150,000 pounds. So no wonder everyone's coming and settling back here. That, yeah. like, that's why, because they're going to England, they're making money, and money. the money that wouldn't get them very much over there, they can come and live like kings here. Yeah. It's not just the money or the fact that, as a man, Gohar automatically has status here. He's also living a life free from the bombardment of negative stereotypes that I've seen wear down the confidence of so many Pakistani boys in Britain. Four hours down the road is Lahore, an ancient city which has become the vibrant cultural heart of modern Pakistan and where I'm headed for a night on the town. <laughs> this is 
This is educated upper middle class Pakistan. So not typical of everyone, but nevertheless, I was struck by a sense of freedom here that I've rarely experienced in Pakistani circles. On the terrace, I met Abdul Rahman, another British Pakistani who'd recently moved to Lahore. I was working in London and uh, it was kind of, it's kind of a difficult place to live sometimes. Yeah. And so I was like, let's try it. Like, let's see how it is over here. And I was really surprised. I was really surprised by how interesting it is here. Well, to be fair, I'm, I, I was really surprised to see what's going on over here. I mean, it seems it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I haven't really been out at night time in Pakistan. No, but... I think that's, you know, from the media and from everything that's portrayed about Pakistan. Like, I thought the same thing. I was not expecting this kind of scene to be happening when I came over. Yeah. So I was also surprised. Just the fact that people can, be, can do what they want and can express themselves creatively in the way that they want, I think is really important. And yeah. it is happening. Yeah. After spending some time in Mirbur and then coming over here to Lahore, I mean, it was a bit of a shock. I haven't ever hung out with young Pakistanis, their nightlife, and there was, you know, a girl on stage and she was singing a song about, that she had written about being a woman and why shouldn't she stand on her own two feet and do what she wants to do, and she dedicated to all the women out there. I mean, it's, it's powerful stuff. The people here, I mean, these are young boys and girls, workmates, hanging out together at night time. This is a lot more westernized than even I was brought up. The next morning, as I crossed the city of Lahore, it occurred to me that some parts of Pakistan are becoming more open-minded than parts of Pakistani Britain. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, thanks. Come on in. I wanted to explore this more with Abdul Rahman, who I met the night before. I do feel like during this journey, I've realised that some people, a lot of people, a lot of especially Pakistani communities, have a very narrow view of what being a good Pakistani or a true Pakistani is, and anything outside of that is wrong. My, I would say my family has the same. It, it was a very closeted view of what Pakistani being Pakistani is because they're in a foreign country, if they feel like entering those unknown fields, the kids will forget about their culture altogether. Should they're just going to become completely like, I don't know, forget about their roots and their heritage. Whereas here, they can go and into these creative fields and these alternative routes because you're in the culture. You're yeah. rooted in the culture. You are here. So there isn't ever that fear of, oh, they'll go too far or they'll forget where they came from because they're here. Yeah, I think that's actually, I've never thought about it that way, but I think that's probably almost definitely true. I think there is that paranoia of an immigrant family of making sure that you still have some connection to your culture. And sometimes that is maybe unproductive in a way. Do you know what I mean? Because it doesn't allow you to express yourself in your cultural ways, right? So, um, whereas over here, I think that because you don't have that fear, you don't have that paranoia of like, oh my God, he's not going to be Pakistani anymore. Or she's not going to have any connection to her roots. So it's just like, you know, you live in Pakistan, so of course you are Pakistani. Mm -hmm. So you can just be whatever you want to be. Mm -hmm. And that gives you that freedom that I think maybe an immigrant diaspora family would not, might not be able to afford themselves. Mm -hmm. I came to Pakistan to see if I could discover where some of the attitudes and cultural values that I've seen in the UK come from. And just by visiting two cities, just by visiting Lahore and Mirpur, you can clearly see the spectrum that exists of Pakistani culture. Those narrow definitions that are imposed on the young men in the UK, when you come to Lahore, you see that they're not imposed in the same way. So much of the cultural inheritance that Asian immigrants have brought with them has helped them to succeed and has vastly enriched Britain. But with my own Pakistani community, 
Could some of those attitudes to gender, to education, be the very things that are now holding them back? I wondered if that resonated with one of the most thoughtful men I'd met on my journey, Nav. So I went back to Bradford to catch up with him. Like you want to succeed in you know, modern England, what does that mean you know, for a young Pakistani or you know, Asian person? What does that mean to us? A young man, what does it mean? It's knowing who you are starts with self-awareness and self-confidence. And self-awareness is basically knowing your place in the world. Like, you know, who are we? British, Pakistani, Muslims, like, you know, what, how do we balance all those three ingredients to kind of define what kind of person we are in this world? And, uh, and the people who kind of know that in their heads, they're the ones who succeed, like, you know, when they can balance those three identities, then nothing can stop you, you know. You come to Bradford and it's, let's be honest, it's quite segregated to a certain extent, isn't it? Kashmiris, Miripuris, whatever you want to call, call them, you know. They came over here, the fathers were peasants, you know, or grandfathers, they didn't have much education. They came over here strictly, like, to work in the mills in the 60s. Girls want to now work, girls want to educate themselves. Mm. The silent revolution going on, I can imagine what it is from a girl's pers perspective. From a boy's perspective, what's holding you guys back now? The problem lied where I, where I think it was, like, where the mentalities were still stuck in, like, a peasant kind of world, in it. So I always say this to my father, I said, we came to, the, we came to a first world country with a third world mentality, and that's where we struggle. Do you think that's changing? Yeah, I do believe it's changing. I, I think people are fed up of certain, you know, thought press processes and third menta certain mentalities. And I think the young generation, the people I talk to anyway on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, they want things to change. They want it to kind of progress. I worry that we're facing a real danger of a whole generation of young British Pakistani men who feel they're disenfranchised and isolated from the rest of society. And that's partly down to the widespread issue of social mobility in the UK in general. The fact that Abdul Rahman and Gohar felt they had better opportunities in Pakistan than in Britain is evidence of that. But it's also down to the fact that this is a community which allows the young men to indulge in this vision of masculinity which seems increasingly outdated. As children of immigrants, all of our lives are shaped by our history, but we're so much more than that. <laughs>